As a medical student, third year clerkships are an exciting yet difficult time. On the one hand, you get to move out of the classroom and into the clinic to do what you went to medical school to do, which is to take care of patients. But on the other hand, you're gonna be challenged intellectually on a daily basis. You'll encounter new patient cases. You'll see complications of bread and butter cases that you thought were supposed to be just simple and straightforward. You'll work with dozens of new people, some easy to work with and others not so much. And you'll have to balance studying for all your tests at the same time. It can be overwhelming at times, but it can also be exhilarating as this is the sort of challenge that forces you to grow as a person. That being said, people usually have a different approach at the end of an experience compared to when they first start. For instance, how someone studies when they first start medical school is usually very different from how they study at the end of medical school. And clerkships are no different. As someone who has completed medical school and evaluated medical students as a resident, here are my top tips for third year clerkships. And if you want advice regarding any specific clerkship, like internal medicine or psychiatry, neurology, and so on, then be sure to check out our clerkship review series on the Med School Insiders blog, link in the description. And in that series, we actually break down each clerkship in painstaking detail, and it serves as a single comprehensive resource for everything you need to know to crush that given rotation. We also have another video over on the Med School Insiders channel going over additional tips for third year clerkships, some of which are not covered here. All right, first tip is to know which hospitals to prioritize. And this is something you need to consider as a second year before you even schedule your third year clerkships. Depending on what specialty you wanna pursue, different hospitals and preceptors are gonna help you get to where you want to be, some more so than others. If you were interested in pursuing psychiatry or ob or plastics, then you should choose those hospitals and those preceptors that are known to go above and beyond for those specialties. Ask residents or upperclassmen who've already finished their clerkships to see which opportunities, which hospitals, which preceptors you wanna work with to help you get into your desired specialty. Now, that being said, that does not mean that you should try to find the clerkships that are just the easiest to get a good grade in. You should find the ones that will allow you to get the most out of that experience. So if you knew 100% you're not going into psychiatry, then sure, go ahead and find that hospital and that preceptor that are easier, that are more likely to give you an honors. But if you do want to go into psychiatry, then you wanna find the opportunities with the strongest preceptors, those who are invested in their students and they create an environment that is conducive to learning. These are the preceptors that you're gonna build strong relationships with. You're gonna work on research projects with them and they're gonna go bat for you when you're applying to residency if you're applying to that specialty. A lot of times students focus so much on trying to get good grades, trying to get that honors, that they forget why they're doing clerkships in the first place. During your clerkships, your primary goals should be to learn and to network. Next up is knowing how to prioritize your time during your third year clerkships. So you're gonna be graded on two main things. Number one, those subjective evaluations from preceptors. And number two, your shelf exam scores. Now, how much each one is weighted is gonna vary depending on the rotation. And some rotations may be, let's say, 50% evaluations and 50% shelf scores, whereas others may be 70% evaluations and then 30% shelf scores or vice versa. And knowing how you are evaluated is gonna help you figure out how to best allocate your limited time. So if shelf exam scores are weighted much more heavily, then staying late in the hospital to impress your preceptors at the expense of studying for your shelf exam may not be ideal. And alternatively, if shelf exam scores are not weighted as heavily, then the calculus is gonna reverse. Now, in addition, third year is also when you take USMLE Step 2 CK. And as we all know, Step 1 has transitioned to pass-fail. And because of that, Step 2 CK is gonna be weighted much more heavily on residency applications. That means that a poor score on Step 2 CK can greatly limit your chance of matching into your desired specialty. And unfortunately, this does mean that it's much more important now to balance your clerkships with studying for Step 2 CK, which you can only do if you're really optimizing your time. And one of the most important things that I did during my clerkships in order to prepare for step two CK was constantly reviewing flashcards. I even made my own Anki deck covering all of the information that I had learned from my third year clerkships. It was all in a single deck. So when I was on a new rotation, I would add cards to that same deck. Now by doing this, I was constantly reviewing my older cards from my prior rotations. In addition to the newer cards, most of my time was spent studying those newer cards because those older cards I'd already seen so many times. And by the way that space repetition works, I had mastered that content and I was seeing them at longer intervals. So it wasn't really adding much more time to be studying and reviewing that old stuff, but I was getting a massive benefit of that long-term retention. So that when step two came around, I mostly knew that information. I would use any bit of downtime I had throughout the day to just go through flashcards, whether that was a few minutes while in clinic between patients or even standing in line at the grocery store. And you may not realize this, it may sound ridiculous, but a few minutes here and there throughout the day can quickly add up. And this reminds me of a funny story. My little cousin actually recently reminded me of this. It was one year during Thanksgiving. It must've been during my third year of med school. 
and we always went to their place for Thanksgiving. So between, let's say 4 to 6 p.m. if we had dinner at 6, 6.30, I just sat down and I did Anki flashcards the whole time. Don't worry, during the Thanksgiving meal, Anki was put away, but the hustle was real, no doubt. Another thing that I would do to optimize my time was to study first thing in the morning. I found that it was much more difficult to sit down and study in a meaningful way with sufficient intensity after a long day in the hospital. You're just exhausted and mentally drained. So to avoid this, I would get to the hospital or clinic early and you know get prepared for the day, pre-round and whatever, and then use that extra time I had before the rest of the team came in to then get some studying done. Now the hard part here, but this is gonna pay dividends, is getting to the hospital or clinic at the same time every day, Monday through Friday. Now the reason being, there's gonna be some days you need to go in extra early. Let's say on surgery, grand rounds is on Wednesday, and for that reason, the entire team starts rounding an hour early. Now you may think, okay, on Wednesdays, I'll just go extra early. No, you make that Wednesday start time your default for every single day. So now you arrive early on Wednesday, let's say you get there at 4 a.m., and you have everything pre-rounded by five, you guys round at 5.15, you're in, in grand rounds by six or whatever. But Thursday and Friday and Monday and Tuesday, you still go in at four o'clock. But now you have extra time to study between pre-rounding and the team starting actual rounds. And the reason that's really important is because getting that sleep rhythm dialed in and being consistent with your sleep day to day is gonna be such a massive game changer for you in terms of your energy and your sleep quality. Now, although I'm not naturally a morning person, I convinced myself during my clerkships that I was. And I found that by starting my day earlier and getting things done in the morning, I just was way more productive. And even today, if I have something that's really pressing, really concerning, I'm gonna make sure to get it done first thing in the morning. Now, by doing these two things, I really cut down on the amount of studying that I had to do at the end of the day, both for my clerkship as well as for step two CK. And then by the time that my dedicated step two CK period rolled around, I was already getting two sixties on my first practice test. And I contribute much of my success with step two to these strategies. And if you wanna learn more about how I scored in the high two sixties on step two CK, check out this video here. Now this next point goes hand in hand with optimizing your time. And that is to make sure you dial in your study resources. You want to be using the high yield, high quality study resources so that you can get the most out of your studying in the least amount of time. During clerkships, Anki was a staple, but I was making all of my own flashcards. But keep in mind that pre-made decks have improved massively back from when I was in med school. And while there is still some utility in making your own flashcards, a lot of people may find that the time saving of using these higher quality pre-made decks are gonna outweigh the benefits you get from creating your own flashcards. In terms of question banks, there are two big contenders. One is Amboss and one is UWorld. Consensus among medical students is that UWorld is gonna be your primary resource for step two CK. After all, it's the most representative what you're gonna see on the actual test. However, Amboss is helpful as a supplement, especially when you're preparing for your shelf exams. So with this in mind, it's generally best practice to use Amboss early on during your clerkships when you're primarily studying for your shelf exams, and then focus more exclusively on UWorld as you get closer to step two. Beyond Anki and question banks, there are gonna be some books and resources that are more or less helpful for different rotations. And you can find our recommendations on again, our clerkship review series on the Med School Insiders blog. Now that we've discussed how to manage your studies outside of your clinicals, Let's talk about how to thrive during them. During your clerkships, there's a delicate balance between being confident and knowing your stuff versus being humble and admitting when you don't know something. This is tougher than it sounds because on one hand, you gotta demonstrate that you're trying, you're learning, you are knowing the things that you should be knowing at your stage in training, but then on the other hand, that you're humble, that you are trying to learn and improve, and that when you don't know something, you're willing to admit, hey, I don't know something. So the key here is to practice some humility with work ethic, right? So you're gonna work hard, you're gonna do your best to study before the cases and know the things that you're supposed to know, which sometimes you won't, which is fine. But on the other hand, you don't wanna be one of those know-it-alls that acts like they know everything. So it's okay not to know things. I mean, after all, you're a medical student, you're there to learn, but you are gonna be put on the spot, ask questions in front of your peers and patients and you know residents and whatnot regularly, and it can be pretty embarrassing when you don't know the answer, right? This is referred to as pimping in medicine, or as some medical students like to call it, getting put in my place. What are they missing? You know, it's kind of hard to think when you're in our face like Yeah, you think it's gonna be easier when you got a real patient really dying? What are you missing? One approach that you might find helpful is when you are inevitably asked something that you don't know, rather than just awkwardly standing there in silence or saying, hey, I, I don't know, try to reason your way through it with what you do know. Because there's a big difference between saying, I have no idea, versus saying, I think it's this because of X, Y, and Z, but I'm not sure. This obviously isn't gonna be appropriate for every single question, but in most cases, when you do try to logic and reason your way through it, even if you don't get it 100% correct, it's much more impressive. It shows that you're trying, that you do have some knowledge, 
and it opens up the door for discussion. Now there is some nuance to this and you're gonna have to read the room a little bit. Not every single question is gonna be amenable to this approach. And then also, if you have no idea what's going on, then don't completely fake it trying to, I mean, you're just gonna look worse that way. But remember, if you're on a rotation and an attending, a resident, they point out a gap in your knowledge, it now becomes your priority to fill in that gap. You never wanna be asked the same question twice and fail to answer it the second time around. This next point goes hand in hand with my previous point, which is don't let your fear of failure or looking bad limit your ability to participate. When I was doing my clerkships, I made it a point to get involved as much as I could. However, there were still some situations where I let fear of failure prevent me from doing certain things. Now, one situation early on during my third year was when a patient was coding and a resident asked me, hey, do you wanna do a round of chest compressions? I declined because this patient's life was on the line and I didn't want my improper technique or whatever to jeopardize that. But looking back on it, I shouldn't have let my fear hold me back from participating and learning. I'd already gotten my ACLS certification, and by that point I had the training of proper pacing and depth for chest compressions, and plus there were so many people around to help correct my technique should I have needed it. So what you gotta remember is that during clerkships, you're gonna be doing a lot of things that you've never done before, but the only way you're going to grow and improve is through experience. The more you do something, the easier it becomes. So you've got to embrace that discomfort and not be afraid of failure. Sometimes you'll mess up and you'll have to learn from that mistake, but more often than not, you'll actually exceed your expectations and do better than you thought. It sounds so obvious, but when you pay close attention and you try to pick up the teachings and apply them, they may seem overwhelming. And you might initially think that, hey, I can't do this, there's so many things going on. But once you actually try, you'll often be surprised at how well you can do. By taking the initiative to do more and by getting involved, not only do you learn much more rapidly and you also impress your preceptors, but overall, the whole experience is just way more fun. You know, it's not a Kevin Jabal video if I don't say this word, so I'm gonna say it here. Pay attention to the nuances of patient care. One of the great things about clerkships that people don't talk about often enough is that you get to see how many different healthcare workers practice and interact with patients. Whenever you work with a new physician, try to identify their strengths and think about how you might wanna incorporate those into your own patient care repertoire. Remember, you're in medical school to become a doctor and your third year clerkships are a great time to start thinking about what kind of doctor you wanna be. I remember one doctor in particular that had great bedside manner. He was able to quickly build rapport with his patients and make them laugh while still remaining incredibly professional. And I thought, damn, I wish my doctor was like this and I wanna be like this myself. And that then inspired me to work on my own bedside manner and allowed me to incorporate more of my personality into my interaction with patients. When you're working with new people, remember that everyone is doing some things right and some things wrong, but ultimately there's something to learn from everyone. And this extends beyond doctors as well. Just because you're in medical school and training to become a doctor, doesn't mean that you can't learn from other people on the healthcare team, whether that's nurses or non-clinical staff, even patients. So be humble, use the opportunity to broaden your horizons and grow into that doctor that you want to be. Third year clerkships are difficult, they're stressful, but they're a time of incredible growth too. If I didn't have those experiences that I did, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. I hope the tips from this video are gonna help you excel during your third year clerkships and on your way to becoming a happier, healthier, and more effective future physician. My friends, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to check out our Med School Insiders video covering third year clerkships here, as well as our clerkship review series on the Med School Insiders blog. Much love, and I'll see you guys there.